Hi, I'm Amber Longmore, a student at Rome Free Academy. Um, Rachel Poom and I are doing an interview with Mr. George Glenn Hall, who was in the Navy in 1943 during World War II. Start of the interview, let's start at the beginning. First off, like, what year did you enlist and how old were you? How old were you when you enlisted? Uh, well, uh, I've got two stories, this, that's all. When I was 17, I joined the Navy. They took me down and examined me. Well, I was as tall as I am now, but I only weighed 100 pounds. So they gave me a, rejected me. And then when I turned 18, I was drafted. And they went through the Army. Then I went in and took the physical, I passed it. So they said, two, one line go here. One line go here. So I took one line for the Navy and one line for the Army, so I got in the Navy in. anyway. Okay. Because um. if I wouldn't have passed on it, went in when I was 17. The way it was, I went in when I was 18. Okay. Um, what reasons did you have for enlisting when you were 17? Do you have any reasons? Uh -huh. Yes, I wanted to fight for my country. Go in. See, I didn't go to the eighth grade in school, and uh, I was 16 in the eighth grade, so I had to go to a vocational school. In my state, it's the law, and I was at the vocational school. And when I was 17, the war came on. As soon as I could get 17, I joined up because I wanted to go in, take care of my part of the world. Okay. Um, where did you receive your training at? Great Lakes, Illinois. Uh, it's a naval train station. Okay, what kind of training did you receive? Pardon? What kind of training did you receive? Well, we learned, uh, showed us pictures of Japanese ships and airplanes and tanks and stuff like that. Then they taught everybody who didn't know how to swim, had to learn how to swim. Uh, and then they put us in a pool and they had a ring there. And they put fire in it, you gotta swim up, come up and splash some water away so you can come up and breathe. Because if you were on a ship and the oil caught fire, you had to learn that. And uh, then we did uh, uh, the training we did uh, for whatever I was, which was a fireman. So I was being trained in a boiler room. Okay. Um, it says here on your information sheet that you were a third class water tender. What exactly is that? Well, say down in the fire room, the boiler room, you got these big boilers. And fresh water goes in them. And you got oil burners, you push in them. Heats the water up, makes steam. Well, the, the water tender is the second man on the watch. That's a petty officer. That's a non commissioned officer. And the fireman is the one that operates uh, the burners to, to regulate the oil. If you go faster, you got to put one of the higher nozzle in it. And uh, that's why the water tender, all way up above by the big tank, you had to keep it up three quarters of the level so that you'd have water in there so you could have steam all the time. All right. Um, is there anything that really sticks out in your mind from World War II? It's one thing that you can remember. Yeah, let's talk a little louder right now. What was the, like, the one thing that sticks out most about World War II? Well, one thing was, <coughs> excuse me, uh, when we was in Atlantic, uh, taking the second convoy across, the subs got through and they got a couple merchant ships. And we, we being on a smaller ship, we went closer to pick up the guys who were in the water because it was uh, around winter time then and it didn't last too long in the water. And there were so many guys in the water, and they were trying so hard to get away that they were swimming right into the screws on the ship, and it was cutting them up. So they had to shut down all the engines so we could take them aboard. And we picked up 25 English merchant marines. Okay. Um, so we also had to go aboard the ship to see if anybody was alive 
that couldn't get off. You know, if someone's wounded, they can't move. So they took a pick the person from each section, like some from the fire room, some from the boiler room, some from maintenance, and some from sea. And uh, well, we went to go on board there. We checked. I opened the hatch, and there was a guy all burned up on the ladder. So there was no sense going down there. See with anybody in there. On your information sheet, it said that your daily life was good. How so? Well, I enjoyed it. I mean, to me, it was an adventure. It was being patriotic, and I was doing something that I was happy about. And, uh, and it was a good life. I didn't never got in the Atlantic. I only got to go to shore two times. And then when I went over to the Pacific, which I was over there two years, almost a little over two years, I only got to go ashore three times, and that was on the aisle. Mm -hmm. okay. It said that you stated your equipment worked well. What, what equipment exactly did you use? Well, this special ship, which I'll, I'll tell you what's on it when we get to it, the thing. And this, this special ship was made especially for uh, German submarines. And it had all sonar and radar and guns and tubes and all this other stuff. And that, that was made, they built them especially for the German submarine, and that's what helped defeat them. Plus, they were also there to escort convoys so that they could get the munitions and fuel and everything else for the fighting zone. Okay. Um, in answering the question on your information sheet, how were your officers? You said they were all good except the skipper. What, what was wrong with the skipper? Well, what was wrong with the skipper was we only had three inch guns on our ship. And uh, in the Pacific, the law was that they had to have a five-inch gun. Well, he told them we had five-inch guns. And when we got over there, they kept us there. So we all got, got kind of peeved because we didn't want to go over to the Pacific. Why well, a lot of people did so I wanted to go. I enjoyed it over there. <laughs> okay. Um, did any one person during World War II have a lasting impression on you? Pardon? Did any one person have like an impression on you? I, I can't remember anybody that I was uh, good in with or knew well. I was a person, I was a person that don't go with people. I like to be by myself. So I really can't remember nobody. Oh, I'm going to might be back. We had a, a Jew, I think he was, and uh, he couldn't swim and they tried to teach him how to swim. And he wouldn't learn, wouldn't learn. So they finally had to push him in the water. Well, I, I kind of kind of become friends with him. He always stuck around me a little bit. But that's about all. Um, it says that you were in a number of locations in theaters. Um, one of them was like, yeah. the Atlantic. Would you like to talk to us about that? Well, see, we start out is an American theater. That's up to the 300 mile limit. The ships that go in that is American theater. And as you get outside that, you went in the Atlantic and, and Mediterranean. That's just a, uh, uh, pardon me, the position that you're in there. And then when we went over to seas, I went in the Pacific and Asia. Okay. Um, did you ever have any problems? All right, would you like to tell us about the USS Cronin? <coughs> All right, USS Cronin. As it's designated as DE. That means escort destroyer. They were made specially for the Japanese, I mean not Japanese, the German submarines, U-boats, that were sinking the ships. And the reason they were so good was we only took 14 foot of water. Another, I mean the other side that was in the water was only 14 feet deep and there was no other ship that shallow, which helped us to go faster more speed. We also had two fire rooms, two boilers, I mean two engine rooms. And the fire room created uh, steam for the turbine generators that run the screws on the ship. One screw could be going forward and one could go backwards. Where other ships only you could do was go forward or backward. So we had a great turning ability to avoid anything or get anything. Then we had radar, we had sonar, 
which was brand new, that could go down and spot a submarine and pick it up. And then we had uh, depth charges. Well, it started out with the armament first. Up front was two three-inch guns. The right and the left behind the three-inch gun were two 20 millimeters. That was four 20 millimeters, two uh, three-inch in the front. And the tail end, they had one three-inch and two 20 millimeters. Up on the bridge, behind the bridge, on what they call the boat deck, we had four torpedoes. And we had 1.1 anti-aircraft gun. And then uh, I had the 50 calibers and 30 calibers mounted on the bridge. For armament for the submarines, on the very front of the ship, we had what we called hedgehogs. There was 24 of them. They were in a box. And when you fired them, they'd go up and they'd complete a 50-foot circle. Now these would not go off unless they hit something. So they were, they had a hit to destroy. Down on the side, went the starboard port of the ship, we had K guns, which fired a depth charge. We had two of them on each side there. So that made four there. And on the tail end, we had two racks of depth charges where they could set them and roll them off for the submarine. Concluding that other thing, we had four draft fire rooms. And this was a boiler inside of a boiler with air pressure in it. Whenever we changed speeds, there would be no smoke coming out of the smokestack. So the, with that and the great turn in ability and the 24 24 knots we could do it was, it was great for anything. That's the specialties of all of it. And then that's about it as far as Iron Man that goes. What were the sleeping accommodations like? Well, and on our ship, they were our, the walls, the walls of the ship, which would be the outside, you now they slammed. They had uh, four bunks. Well, they weren't bunks. It's an oblong piece of metal bolted to the wall. Then we had a piece of canvas on there with eye holes in it. And you take the eye hole, you put the rope through it, and then around the piping, and that was our bed. And then, we, of course, we had sheets and, you know, stuff like that. And then during the daytime, they take and push them all up against the wall so there was, it wouldn't take no other space up. What was the food like? Pardon? The food. I you still didn't get that one. What was the food like? Oh, well, uh, we'll put it this way. We we were a small ship, and uh, we usually got what we wanted. And uh, I'd say the food was sometimes good, sometimes bad. Seeing that we couldn't go ashore, and I, I had no other food that I could distinguish if it was good or bad. But we didn't die. It was, you know, we had plenty. We even, before we went aboard the ship, got our crews together, we all chipped in and got a soft ice cream machine. So we had ice cream, which a lot of the ships out there didn't have. What Well, I think the best thing to tell you is like, my name is Glenn G. Hall. I'm a veteran of World War II. I was born in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And uh, I enjoyed the Navy very well. I liked it. After we went to the Atlantic, we went over to the Pacific. And there we went to the Philippine Islands where I controlled patrol duties. We'd go to Mindanao, Japan, Subi Bay, Manila, Kirigidor, all those islands. We were there to keep the Japs from moving or to keep them warm. Um, we stayed there, like I said, I was there. I was in the Atlantic from uh, 43 to 44, and out in the Pacific from 44 to 46. And, uh, I got uh, the Philippine Liberation Medal for the Philippines 
and I got the victory medal for World War II. You know, that stopped thing going on. Oh yeah, when, when one trip we made, you know, it was an old, uh, when the Navy first started out, all their carriers got destroyed. So they built these ones on top of these big, you know, freighters like. Well, there was a spare one in the Pacific, and the Chinese wanted it. So they wanted someone to, to convoy it up through St. Tao River. It's up to the, their harbor was. But it was loaded with floating mine. So we went ahead, and every time we'd see a floating mine, they'd open up with a 20 millimeter and blow them up. And we blew up about 25 mines getting that up in St. Tao, China. Then we went back to patrol. We went down to Australia, and there they had a ship that was almost similar to ours. They call it a corvette, and we would do patrol duty with them for a while. And then we went back up to the Philippines. And like I said, up there, the only time we got to shore was the Subic Bay. The officers got to go ashore because they had an officers' club there. But us, they had an island in the center of the bay. They gave us two cans of beer apiece, but a bats and balls and gloves, and we'd stay there for a day. We could swim and do all sorts of things like that. But uh, most of the time it was aboard the ship. But like I said, I enjoyed it. To me, it was adventure and being patriotic and doing the job I was supposed to do. Would you like to tell us about um, Vietnam? Well, there, I didn't have, I was in the Air Force, and uh, I was the first part, when I first got over there, I, when I was in the Air Force, I was with the bombers here at McDill, and when I went down there, I had to go back to the A group, a propeller plane, so I had to learn, go down to Florida, and get educated in that, and I went over there, and I pre-flighted, and check planes out, and then finally an opening opened in a, what they call a 780 section. It's all parts for the airplanes, like records and uh, armored seats and all that other stuff. And I had to keep it in records. That's what I did over there. What was the weather like? Now we'll get to the good part. Well, in the Atlantic, in the wintertime, it's terrible. You've got waves so high. We'd be ships, I'd be, we'd be 300 feet from a ship outside of you. And you look over there one minute and it ain't there. And the next minute, it's there. The waves were that big and that high that when the wave, you'd be on the upper side of the wave, and they'd be on the downside of the way you couldn't see one minute, which is like a teeter totter And that's another bad thing about me being in the Navy, too. I was a little seasick. I didn't mind the roll, the sideway roll. But when it went into the waves, and the front end lifted up, and came smashing down, I was sick. I used to go down and watch in the fire room, and I'd have to take a pail and set it between my legs and eat crackers because I was so sick. But then after about six months, I got used to that. And then now uh, you go like go over in the Pacific, there was a couple of rough places too. In the South Sand Seas, when the weather was real calm and real nice, you look out on the, the water and it was just like an ice skating rink. It was just level, shiny, no waves, no ripples, no not. And then in five seconds, you can be a storm, you can be going all over the place. Our ship, the 18 that only took 14 foot of water, did not have the great tipping ability of a bigger ship that would take 20, 30, or 40 feet in depth of water. So we had, our limit was 68 degrees, and we, we hit a 65 many a times from close being turned over. And also, when the big waves come, they hit the front bow of the ship, and they went completely up over her. And all the outside action had to be closed because the whole ship just got covered in 
with water. And all that was another thing I want to say about the ship too. We had uh, 12 officers, 250 men, and the ship was two, three, 350 feet long. And uh, it didn't give you much room, of course. Everybody, we stood watches, four on, eight off. And when I first went aboard the ship, we had what we call battle station. And when I, my battle station was behind the forward three inch gun. Because behind them were the two guys with the 20 millimeter. And when they put a shell in there and fired it, it'd come out if the gun was pointed the right way, you could hit one of them guys with a hot shell. So I had to stand behind the thing when they put the shell in, put one hand down and one hand behind. And when I fired it, I'd catch it and put it down on the ground. And then later on, when I became a petty officer, my battle station was uh, down in a compartment for, for control, for if a shell come through or anything like that happened. A pipe break close, you try to fix it. Uh, it was a, as you go up in rank, you get better. Uh, uh, I see now. A couple other things I want to say there. Dave. I guess that's no, that's all right. Oh yeah, I wanted to tell you about going across the international date line. What they did when we left the city. When we left the States, they, they took three garbage cans. And all during the time we was going over to the Pacific, they went and kept putting garbage in there, kept putting garbage in there, and never washed them out. So when we come to the International Date Line, we had some people on the ship that had already been across. But all, all, all us new troops that were on there, that were just learning and coming up in the rain, were called polywalks. And we didn't weren't across the International Date Line. So the day we crossed the International Date Line, we all had a line up, they cut all our hair off, all our eyebrows off, bald our heads. We had to go down, crawl through them stinking garbage cans with all that grease and all that stuff in there. We'd come out, we'd run around, they hit us with paddles. We had to take the, the ones that went across before, we had to serve them breakfast in the morning and supper at night. And then we got this plaque for going over, and then once you go over, you're, you're in it. And the only way you can get that international date line then is being on a ship. If you go, if you're on a, let's say, a, a freighter or a transport that was putting troops over there, they had so many guys that they could only do it to just a Navy guy, not anybody else that was on the ship. So that enjoyed that part of it. <laughs> it was funny. Everybody was ball headed. We went, when we went aboard the ship, they took our whole class that was at Great Lakes, and each one was put in a different section. Trained firemen, trained engineer, trained torpedo men, trained gunners. And we all went in the same ship. Same class went to the same ship. So we all started out as firemen second, then you went to firemen third. And then you, I mean, yeah, fireman third, fireman second, then fireman first, and then petty officers come after that. Yeah, let's see now. Nah. Like you said, uh, you talked about the child before, and that was good, but everybody had to eat at different times because we only had a small room for that. But we did have movies. We used to put them on the fan tail of the ship and have movies every once in a while. And uh, whenever we was on patrol duty or anything like that, we just patrolled. That's all we did. We, we, the Japanese we used to take barges from one island to the other. And the Philippines is loaded with islands. You, you can go ahead and ask a few questions now if you want. You brought in a, a dagger, the U.S. Um, the German dagger. Pardon? Is the dagger? 
Do you want to tell us about that? How you got it? Oh, I got this in the Air Force. I was in the Air Force station over in Germany. And um, I was sitting at a table in the mess hall. And at this, at this, there was an old German there. He was uh, working there. You know, he was a kitchen helper. And I, every time he'd come by, he'd have me for a cigarette. So I'd give him a cigarette. So I told him one day, I said, uh, do you have any war cylinders? I said, I was in the Navy during World War II. I said, I never even got nowhere near Nazis or Germans. And I said, I took convoys over in the Mediterranean. And I said that the planes flew over it, but they never bombed us because they always bombed the bigger ships, ships with the transports on. He says, yeah, he says, I got a, an SS driver. I said, well, how about a pack of cigarettes? So he gave me the pack of cigarettes for this and all that other stuff I got there. Now, let's see, there was something else I wanted to say. Oh, yeah, about going over the Atlantic. Well, I made three trips, three uh, convoys. The convoys had anywhere between 30 or 40 ships in it. That's merchants, oil tankers, ammunition ships, troop ships. We were on the outside of them, and they were on the inside. We patrolled. We had seven, seven of us type ship, plus a DD. Uh, you could only go as fast as the fastest ship. And the fastest ship in the convoy was eight knots. So it took us seven to ten days to go from, like, Brooklyn, New York, or Norfolk, Virginia, to the Mediterranean. The first part, the first one we went, we landed in Libya, where Tripoli is. We landed there because they just got done taking North Africa then. In the second trip we came in, because that's when we had that, when the subs got a couple of merchant ships. We went in the Mediterranean again and we stopped at Palermo, Sicily, because at that time there, the Americans were just going ashore in Italy. And then third trip, we only got about halfway where we was going and they, we got orders to be assigned to the Philippines, the Pacific, Pacific Island. And when we did then, we went back to the Boston and then to Norfolk, Virginia. Then we went through the canal all the way up and then through Island, Capitolicus, and all these islands and that till we got to the Philippines. That took us quite a while to get there. And you know, like I said, I was never in no real combat situation of all my military service, except in Vietnam. There I had a few rocket shot at us. But I was one of the lucky ones. Go ahead for a few more questions, you want? Um, is there anything you'd like to tell us? I mean, we really don't have any questions for you. All right. Is there anything you'd like to tell us? Um. You'd like to tell us about your Korean conflict that you were in? Well, there I didn't really get to Korea. Now, here's a, this is a sticky point. <laughs> See, up to the three-mile limit in the United States is not considered a combat zone. Anything on the other side of 300 miles is considered a combat zone. Well, when I, I was in the, when I got out of the Navy in 46, I joined the Naval Reserves. I went to a few meetings and I didn't like the way they were operating them. So, I just didn't go to meetings anymore, but I was still in the United States Navy Reserve. In 1950, I got a letter from the War Department stating that I was back on active duty. I was supposed to report to Great Lake Illinois for a week session. So I went there and did all they did with us there was re extinguish our memories a little bit. Then I went up to Brooklyn, New York, 
Ah, uh, New York. And uh, I was assigned to a APA 136. That was a type of ship that carried troops that had the landing crafts on the side, and the troops climb over the side and get in their landing crafts. At that time, we were going to, they were up in Korea where the ice and the snow was. So they wanted to find out if they could land landing craft and support, support troops there. So we took a, a load of troops and went up to Green Bay, Michigan, not Green Bay, Michigan, Greenland, Thule, Greenland. And uh, they practiced going on the shore on the ice to see if they could do it and see how things went. And when we got back to the States, they said, well, there's no need for that because their troops are moving back. That's when they were pushing them back in Korea. So they brought me aboard another ship. And this was a boat that had provision. It lived on both sides, and in the center was like a big swimming pool. And what the thing would do was call the landing ship docks. And we'd open the pumps up, pump water in there, sink down, open the back door, and the Marines come in with their tanks that floated in the water. And they'd go up in there, and then we'd bring the ship back up, and they'd be on the bottom of the ship. That was the way we would haul them to where they were supposed to go, if we ever went any place. So that's what we did there in that ship. And uh, that's all I did during the Korean. I didn't get into conflict. I didn't get over to Korea, but I still got $300 bonus and got my veteran rights for Korea. As long as you were past the 300 mile limit, it was considered a combat zone even. Well, Korea did not have very many ships. Um, is there anything else you'd like to tell us before we end? Yeah, talk just a little bit louder, dear. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us before we end this? Well, there ain't too much more I can think about. Let me think a second, maybe I think something else coming up. From. I don't know, I can't, can't think. You got enough time or you need some more? Well, we're fine if you want, you're done, but if you have anything to say, just let us know. to think of some other way. Well, I could probably talk a little bit more about the Philippine Islands. Uh, uh, there is a one time that over the Philippine Islands, a tug was towing a floating dry docks, what they call it. It has all, visual, all air tanks individually, oh, I'd say 30 feet by 30 feet. Then it had the planking along the side and the motor, the hoist the boats up and that end. Well, they were towing it and it broke loose. The cable broke loose and there was no way they could get it, hook it up again because rough weather was coming. And they couldn't leave that out there because at night the ships couldn't see it to be too, we look right straight through it. So they, they'd give us orders to destroy it. So we opened up on it with about everything we had and the thing kept floating. Everything up above, the motors and the the scaffolding and all that got blown up, but the tank parts wouldn't because they had about, I'd say, 50 tanks and they were 30 by 30. So the only way they could do it, they had to send a man in the launch boat over there and take a submachine gun and shoot each tank full of holes so it would sink. Um, okay, would you like to make an overall generalization about World War II? A general statement? Pardon? Would you like to make a general statement about World War II, like what you tell people? Well, uh, World War II, to me, was a lot better than the Vietnam and Korea, because you were fighting for, for something that, that belonged to you. Uh, and there also was because the Germans had so many U-boats, if it wouldn't have been for 
the scientists, and the ships like mine, we probably would have lost that war. I think, uh, I, even though a lot of people don't understand it, I liked World War II better than I did Korea and Vietnam. Because for some reason, there was something there. That's about it. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure.